Well, I think it's time to start. A warm welcome to all of you. I'm the uh, German permanent representative to the United Nations here in Geneva and other international organizations. Um, welcome to you at the Maison de la, de la Paix. Our co-hosts today are the Interparliamentary uh, Union, IPU, as well as the Inclusive Peace and Transition Initiative, IPTI, of the Graduate Institute, which is also a partner of the German Federal Foreign Office and uh, hosting you here. Uh, our co-host organizations both support peace processes in the world over. The IPTI conducts research and provides expertise on the inclusion of different actors in peace and transition processes. The IPU, through its work with parliamentarians, is dedicated to achieving peace through democratic dialogue. Our joint interest today is to understand better how to attain sustainable peace. We look at countries where Germany has long since supported national governments and their people in their various endeavors to end conflict and to reach sustainable peace in Afghanistan, Yemen, and Sri Lanka. While every single one of these cases has its own historical context, and not all processes have led to peace agreements, all of them have witnessed multiple attempts to end conflict and stabilize volatile situations. As we speak, new peace processes in some of the countries concerned are ongoing. Uh, think of the international reconciliation, reconciliation process in Sri Lanka that came into being after democratic elections in 2015. Today, we want uh, not to focus on the analysis of the present situation, but we want to take a look back and better understand why sustainable peace has not yet been achieved in these countries and want to learn from these experiences, adapt our approaches, and find new solutions for today's challenges, the, what you call commonly the lessons learned approach. Keeping up with the challenges of uh, ever more complex conflicts in the world requires continued learning, renewal of concepts, and adaptation of structures. For Germany, even more so, since expectations towards German contributions to crisis prevention, stabilization, and peace building have grown considerably at home and abroad. The German government has acknowledged this and decided, uh, and I quote, to accept responsibility and to assume leadership. The, that is from the 2016 White Paper on Security Policy, by making earlier and more effective contributions. In March 2015, the German Federal Foreign Office, following a broad public review of Germany's foreign policy, established a new directorate for crisis prevention. Crisis prevention, stabilization, and post-conflict peace building and humanitarian assistance. These were all desks spread all over the ministry. And since, uh, obviously, the crisis mode is not a interruption of a more peaceful time once in a while, but it's now, I think, we have to face it the permanent mode, and sometimes more than one big crisis, some are, uh, are overlapping. Uh, we, we made this quite important change of the interior structure of our ministry. Um, a new set of guidelines is prepared to provide a comprehensive strategic framework and key guiding principles for German contributions to crisis engagement. Among other things, um, they do so by drawing from lessons from the recent past as we do here today. That is the one input to these uh, uh, guidelines. In Germany, we have thus set up an inclusive public consultation mechanism under the theme Peace Lab 216, uh, moving crisis prevention forward. The Peace Lab process provides a platform for policy and government 
civil society and research to discuss and suggest how Germany can play an even more effective role in supporting peace in its, in its partner countries. This under the uh, uh, website Peace Lab 2015. Today we are glad to have uh, this event with the IPU and the IPTI. Motto is learning from each other and from our experience. We will only increase our impact in peacemaking and peace building if we learn from, uh, uh, from research and if we find support from engaged uh, civil society organizations but we have to convince them, uh, first of all, about the, 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 the good foundation of our approach. Let me thank you uh, once again for being with us today. And I'm looking forward to informative presentations and fruitful discussions. Uh, and I would like to thank in advance our distinguished panelists uh, here, present here. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Ambassador. I'm Tanja Parfenholz, the Director of the Inclusive Peace and Transition Initiative here at the Great Institute. And I would, I'm the moderator, and uh, I would like to invite my panelists to come up here. And as you have seen, there is, if you need internet access, it's over there. And you are very free, just come. You are free to tweet the event. Uh, you can, it's, there's a hashtag for the Geneva Peace Week. And uh, you see, um, and, and here's the internet connection. Um, thank you very much, Ambassador, for this introductory word. And I think it's um, at IPTI, it's like in our DNA to work with partners and uh, to uh, provide the research we have on comparative peace processes and what works and what does not work, basically, to the world, so to say. And, of course, we know that you cannot just write a nice paper and then expect that somebody loads it down from the Internet and changes their policies. And uh, that's why uh, we basically work with governments, with uh, non-governmental organizations, sometimes even with conflict parties, to provide this knowledge. And I think what is really interesting, and that was also the reason why we wanted to contribute to the Geneva Peace Week with this topic, is to see that very often there is these sort of rushed decisions like next peace process is coming, what needs to be put into an agreement, and not enough time is spent into really going back. Why have these agreements not been sustainable? Because I think the, the point is really, it's not about, uh, it's of course a lot about ending violence. It's still a topic, it's still an issue. If you look at uh, places like Syria, of course you want to end the violence, but what are the conditions that need to be in those peace deals that makes these deals sort of not just ending violence, but really making, providing the conditions that peace can be sustained over time? And why does it often fail? And we learn a lot from those cases where you say, why has it not worked? and also from the cases where has it worked. And so the idea of today is really not saying like, oh, this process has not worked, and it's a failure or something like that, because peace processes are political transitions, are one element in political transitions, and they take oftentimes generations, they take long. So we're talking about a particular time in a historical perspective that's like, this has not worked in this historical piece time, but we want to know really what were these conditions, and then, so what we will do here is, I will ask the panelists um, a couple of rounds to understand what their analysis is, what were the conditions that these uh, agreements, which of course not all of the agreements we're talking about were classical peace agreements, some were ceasefire agreements, other were more constitution making processes, where we look into uh, what are these conditions that made them not sustainable yet. And then to find out what does this mean basically for the processes today and how can these lessons be fed in both into the ongoing processes but then also what's the cross-learning for ongoing processes. And with this I would like to um, introduce our really interesting panel and um, we have um, actually here, to 
to my left, we have Rafat al akhali He is actually he was the former Minister of Youth and Sport in the government, but uh, and is more at the moment engaged uh, with Oxford University and Alice in London School of Economics on a project on fragility, studying the conditions. I think you had an even maybe more interesting job before that, and that was uh, really looking into the reform efforts of the of the government on implementing the transition. And even before that, he had a interesting activity or job is maybe the wrong word. He was a youth activist uh, in the transition. So I think it's very interesting to see uh, from, from the activism to the government and then out of government to research. So I think we, we're looking very much forward to hear from you. In the middle, we have Martin Stürzinger, an old friend. <laughs> we have been uh, working together in Sri Lanka and uh, he's basically, uh, if you want to know anything about Sri Lanka, he's the one. And uh, so he functions usually as a, like a lexicon on, uh, you can call him on any, any topic and he will answer that. So, so he's been uh, working as a journalist uh, before and there he was already specialized in Sri Lanka and then he just couldn't let go and continue working for the Swiss government as a peace building advisor in Sri Lanka during the peace process, later also in, in Nepal and now back at the foreign office since a few years uh, looking into Sri Lanka and Nepal. And... Um, also very interesting to hear what your analysis is. And then we, we have two of our left. You see the Gen Geneva Gender Championship is like framed here. And we're very proud that we always manage to show that uh, the Geneva Championship is not just something like, oh, you have to put a woman on the panel. No, we have, uh, <laughs> you can show that this is really adding a lot of substance. And that's why I'm happy to have um, Ambassador Shogriya Barakhaza, she is actually not only former member of parliament and has been instrumental in writing the Afghan constitution. And she was also like an underground teacher, as we heard now during the Taliban time in Afghanistan, where the sort of former government was not able to continue and is currently the Afghan ambassador to Norway. Um, so I think we're very sort of excited also to hear your perspectives. And she has dealt a lot with human rights issues and which we know that are currently sort of also uh, under threat, to say maybe <laughs> the least. So I would like to start um, basically, um, Rafat, with you to ask you, um, you have been part of the process of the, of the national dialogue where we know there was an elite deal in, in Yemen where the big powers basically came together and decided we have to do something. And then the national dialogue was set up as sort of a body with a kind of mixed and broader mandate, but coming up for recommendations for the constitution. And we know that the dialogue was a very participatory process with uh, minority groups, women, youth involved, both in a quota, but also with separate delegations, which is a very uh, sort of novelty in, in our field. So it was very representative, and uh, it came up with a lot of recommendations, and then these recommendations were never implemented, and war broke out again. So how come? Thanks, thanks, Tanya. And I think, as you mentioned, there were uh, always successes and, and more challenges in, in any process. And, and maybe I'll just focus on, on three of the challenges that we saw in, in the uh, National Dialogue uh, Conference. And the first one was the issue of uh, representation. Um, and that's where, in trying to include a lot of the, uh, let's say, informal and organized groups, such as youth, civil society, women, um, it became very challenging to try and, and decide how do you select the representatives of youth. Um, because uh, it was very easy for the political parties to say, these are our representatives, you know, it's a party, very well structured. Um, but when, who gets to say, this is the representatives of youth? That's where we got stuck initially when we were designing um, for the National Dialogue. And so we tried to come up with innovative uh, processes to try and um, basically have a selection process that is at least, you know, to a great extent, uh, transparent and, and um, based on, on clear criteria. Um, that was very difficult because, um, you know, we, there was a, an advertisement put out in, in major newspapers that anyone who, want, who felt that they met the minimum qualifications, which was basically to be young and to be um, active and want to change, uh, which applies to basically <laughs> every one of the 14 million young people in Yemen or 18 million. So um, that opened the, uh, the gates uh, for a flood of 
tens of thousands of application from, uh, applications from all across Yemen saying, uh, well, you know, we want to represent uh, young people. Um, and so practically it became um, not feasible to, to go through that process anymore. Um, and so it ended up being a, a very mixed uh, process where political parties were supposed to put uh, forward their own young representatives in, in a quota, but then there was this separate group uh, that was supposed to be for independent youth, so not part of the political parties. And that's where the huge issue was. Um, and it ended up being different power centers uh, pushing their own representatives, pl plus a number of, of independent or truly independent, let's say, youth who were, who were able to um, put themselves forward uh, in the scene uh, to be uh, kind of identified and selected as a youth leader that should be part of that. Uh, so that was one issue, the, the selection issue, and, and that applied across civil society, uh, trying to figure out who represents civil society organizations when there is no process, there is no council, there is no um, democratic uh, representation uh, that could be uh, figured out. Um, the second one was probably the uh, disconnect that eventually took place as the months went by. Uh, by the group that was in the national dialogue, around 500 people uh, in a hotel, and what was happening at the ground level. So although there were uh, processes built in for, um, for inclusion, for um, consultations uh, with people on the ground, those were kind of tagged into the, the official process. So as things were progressing and people are already making decisions on, for example, the um, structure of the state, um, solutions for human rights, um, those consultations were not happening. So they were happening later uh, at a stage where it was no longer relevant and a lot of people felt, you know, why are you um, coming up with these uh, tents, consultation tents in different uh, cities when really, uh, where is our input going? There was no clear link into where the input was going. Uh, so that was a huge disconnect that, that, that took place. Um, and it was a, always a catch-up process, you know, we've already taken the decisions, but we need to do some consultation. Let's just go out, do some consultations, see how it goes. Um, so I would say that was the second part. The third part was not related directly to the national dialogue, but it was this increased focus on the political process, which was the national dialogue, and um, basically ignoring the economic situation on the ground. Uh, all basic services deteriorated. Uh, in that period, uh, 2012 to 2014, uh, while there was so much uh, hope uh, and demands after the protests in 2011 that things should change from everything from you know, governance and uh, corruption um, to, to uh, having proper uh, basic services, what happened was a, a clear decline in all of that from security to electricity to water to jobs to the economy because there was uh, a, a very um, dysfunctional, I would say, uh, government uh, because of the fact of it being split and divided between the different political parties, which made it very hard to make any decisions in that government. And that left the government basically not able to deliver. And as people felt increasingly disconnected from this, what began to seem an elite process uh, of national dialogue, completely disconnected from their daily lives where, again, um, no jobs, nothing changed, things are even getting worse. Um, it, it began uh, to be very clear that even after the NDC, uh, the national dialogue outcomes came out, we did not have a way to link it back to what people were seeing on the ground. And that was a, a, the wave of discontent and, and the wave of um, grievances that fueled the initial um, rebel movement, and, and they were able to capitalize on that and come in under this uh, umbrella of, of uh, making things better, uh, demanding a better life for citizens. So I think those are the three areas that I would uh, highlight in terms of so, challenges. So, so what you're saying is basically, and which very much confirms our research, that uh, when you have a, a fairly representative looking body, it doesn't mean it is representative, because the devil is in the detail what is exactly the, the nomination, the selection criteria, and how do you get a real representativeness? And I think we see that often, that there's also, when the UN leads the process, like uh, in Yemen, that people say, like, how can we make this more representative? And then it's still often a counting game, like how many youths have been there, how many civil society, how many women, instead of really looking into the quality of that representativeness. So I think that's one, and then the other one you said, which we also find across cases, is this lack of public support over time. That 
because of this disconnect of these elite processes from, let's say, the bases. Even if, and that's also interesting in your case, even if you have consultations going on, and it looks like, oh, people are talking, people are involved, but if people don't uh, feel, and we have seen that in Colombia recently, as you know, after the no vote to the peace agreement, that clearly showed this disconnect between people and the, the political elite, where people, if they don't get a feedback on where they're feeding in, and there's no mechanism, then people lose, uh, of course, the uh, uh, faith in the process. And the other thing, we had this morning discussions with our colleague Alexander from the World Bank, you've seen him maybe on panels yesterday, they're doing this together UN system-wide pr study on prevention, what works, what does not work. And uh, again, this is an attempt to bring the economic factors also into the peace processes and to link the systems more. And I think we, we're seeing all these sort of uh, reflected here. How does this play, uh, Ambassador, for Afghanistan? Is there, do you, do you see similar issues coming up or were there the very different context factors that sort of made it so difficult to make the, the bond deal in 2001, uh, which was also, I remember I was there in 2001 in Bonn. Um, literally, there was at the Petersberg, which is like a hill in Bonn, there was the, 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 the elite negotiations, and then um, there was the civil society consultations, which I was part of the facilitation team. And so we were literally on the foot of the mountain, the civil society, and the elite process was up there, so it was almost... But we had an official connection. We had a daily visit with Brahim, Lakta Brahimi, the UN envoy. But in the civil society place there, there was nobody agreed on anything. And I think as international community, we just thought like, oh, we bring them all in, wonderful, then in three days they make up their mind and the voice of the Afghan people will speak and will make suggestions. And of course they were so divided as everybody else. And it was very naive to just think like just bringing everybody together, everybody would just instantly unite. And so representative, so many women there. And there was so little influence then also because of that. So after the Bonn Agreement, so what was so difficult to, you were part of the constitution writing process, what was so difficult? Thank you. I was not only just someone writing the constitution for my country, and the Bonn Agreement, when it was been drafting, I was one of the optimist Afghan, sitting on that corner and just aiming a bright future. I believe that was like a new chapter on the Afghan social political life. Still, I believe the same, but of course with differences. Let me tell you what's war from Afghanistan perspective, from the generation that I live and born in war, and I still, we are facing many challenges. If there is a no war, no violence, do you believe it's peace? I say no. Peace is something different. When it's just rules of law, would you think it will be a peace? I would say no. Because we experience many type of government. I remember during the Taliban, there was a no war in the entire Afghanistan, except a group which is, they was ruling the country, but in a very small portion. But I never feel it's safe, secure, and peaceful. They was forcing their rules on the people. I will never say that was end of the war. So for me, peace, or from my point of view, from Afghan perspective, or maybe we can give the new interpretation of peace or peace process is to be sustainable, to be inclusive, to bring and taking care of the rights of minorities, seeking for social justice, or the implementation of social justice, plus the rights of women. Of course, it's not easy to bring everyone in one room, and after three days, you will say, everything was been done. No, the country was in a deep crisis, and country was been divided badly. And therefore, even on the Bonn Agreement, few part was been missing. First, a very strong voice of silent majority, as you mentioned. They was representing as a civil society and as a woman, not on top of the leadership. The second, the Hizb Islami, which is they've been a part of the fraction, 
the third was a Taliban. No one was representing them. Today, it's also been missing the same. Same three elements still missing in the political power in Afghanistan. I personally, as a Democrat, I like everyone to stop violence and start thinking different. But it's not an easy. Afghanistan was experienced peace process under the name of Geneva process, just recently in 1987 till 1990. It doesn't work well just because of too many actors was playing. But after an agreement, which is we are proud to have that agreement on a beautiful, friendly country, Germany, the peace process, even the Bonn Agreement, was not been implemented, article by article. Yes, we do have a very good constitution. Yes, we have an election. Yes, we are struggling to fix the system. Yes, we are seeking for ceasefire with Taliban and all other gunmen, which is they are fighting for some, some reason. But is that the end of the war? I believe it's not. We need to do more. Peace process is a long-term process to bring everyone around the table, give them time, and ask them to start from where is the similar point. I was sitting with the Taliban during one of the conference, just a couple of months after when they attacked on me a suicide car bomb. I survived. It was very difficult for me to sit and look at the eyes of those that, because of them, many Afghans lost their life. I were to, I forced to wear burqa. I was been forcing to sit as an educated woman in the house. But I sit on the table because I want to show we need to start from the strong points, not from the weak. If our position was weak enough, we will, may not be the winner of the peace. Peace cannot be a deal. Peace is a process, and it should be inclusive. We should bring people with different, um, let's say, mentality, with different perspective, but with a common ground. If the common ground is lost, we cannot have it. Right now, the common ground, just the recent peace deal between the government of Afghanistan and Hizb Islami was the constitution, the constitution of Afghanistan. First, the first time I heard someone, which is he all the time was against everything, a leader of Hizb Islami, uh, Golbuddin Hikmatyar, he say that respecting the constitution of Afghanistan. And I say, yes, that means something is working. But Taliban till today, they didn't say it. They will accept the constitution. And of course, there's so many official and unofficial sources for war. If it's a opium grow, if it's a ideas of extremism on the region, or if it's going to be a playground for everyone to play with is their politics on that region. My country was been badly occupied with different players and actors. And every single of them are carrying their own agenda. But in the middle, we, 30 million people, should stand and say, hey, we are here, please. The nation is fatigued, and we lack, and we want peace, no matter what is the price. But if we believe the peace process is someone is coming and killing you every single day, the universities, the schools, the mosques, the roads, the shopping malls, the hotels, the restaurants, the civilian areas are going to be under attack. Still, I should say that, okay, you can do whatever you want, but I'm seeking the peace. No, it doesn't work. We need to start from two different angles. One, be constructive with common ground, peace, dialogue. Second, those whom they are fighting, the government should stand against them. If we tolerate it so much that, okay, because of peace there, we will do nothing. That means we are not willing to bring peace. That means we are starting another chapter of violence back. 
which is, of course, the end will not be a pleasant. It will be a new beginning of new type of war. Yeah. Now, no? yes, sorry, I should not switch it off. So I'm saying um, what you said also what's, what, what echoes what you had said on the representativeness. I mean, even there was the consultations in the Bonn Agreement, but of course, again, it was the same problem. It had to, I, I remember we had to invite people in three days, uh, bring 150 people from Afghanistan in three days. Of course, it's not representative. Uh, but I think you mentioned also another interesting aspect. Often when we talk about inclusion these days in, 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 in high-level negotiations, it's often like, oh, it's the include the goodies, yeah, the women, the civil society, as if they're all equal and they're all having the same ideas. But you mentioned also the Taliban as a major armed group at the time was excluded. And I think that's something often in the exclusion and inclusion debate not really talked about, that it's not only about the non-armed actors that need to be there in order to sustain the peace and bring their issues in, but it's also if you don't in include, of course, the, the main armed groups, uh, how can that, that, that deal sort of be sustained over time? And I think the other aspect which I find interesting that, that, that you mentioned is like, how can you sort of have a process when the violence is continuing and what kind of compromise government makes for the sake of the end of violence and how this sort of compromise kind of compromises the peace. So I think it's, it's almost like a catch-22 situation where, where you're in. And let's, let's go deeper in the next round. I would like to, to see, um, Martin, from, from your perspective on, on Sri Lanka, where you, that at the time, I remember, in at the same time almost like at, this, at the Mon Agreement in Sri Lanka when the ceasefire agreement came, uh, it was celebrated as a, as a big success of the international community having a very novel approach to peace agreements in the sense that uh, the main thing is how do you come up with all these comprehensive complicated agreements and you negotiate while the violence is ongoing. So Sri Lanka was celebrated internationally as the new model where you have a ceasefire agreement first and then you have a peace agreement slowly negotiating while there's no violence and, and, and it didn't work. <laughs> it didn't work. So what was the problem? Uh, thank you, Tanya. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> when reflecting on, on this question, I came up with uh, five different points that, in my view, contributed to a failure of the ceasefire agreement. Uh, the, the first one, in my view, was uh, a lack of a process design. It was a flawed process. Uh, the government of Ranil Wickremesinghe was elected on 5th of December 2001 and the ceasefire agreement was signed on 22nd of February 2002. So two and a half months. Uh, and that was just not time enough for a protracted conflict that you can address all these issues that are there. I'll give you one example. Uh, <clears throat> Norway was the facilitator of the ceasefire agreement, but Norway also became the chair of the so-called Sri Lanka monitoring mission, which was tasked in monitoring ceasefire violations. Now, as a facilitator who wants to bring the parties to the table, you have an interest in being soft, in being nice to the parties, in inviting them and spoiling them as a monitor, uh, of ceasefire violations, you want to be tough and mention every ceasefire violation in order to end that. And that was a role that uh, contradicted each other and eventually it led to a lot of mistrust towards Norway, mainly from the Sinhalese South, but uh, there was also mistrust about the role within the LTTE. And I think it contributed a lot to a failure of the ceasefire agreement. A second point in my view was uh, a lack of uh, inclusivity and consultation. Uh, the government that came to power in December 2001 was uh, a government of Ranil Wickremesinghe from the UNP, but at the same time you had a president from the uh, SLFP, another party, these are the two 
major parties in Sri Lanka, and they never, ever, in the history of Sri Lanka, had to uh, have a cohabitation government, and now they had one. Uh, the Norwegians only dealt with the prime minister, and the president was not informed and not consulted. And that, of course, increased the mistrust uh, among the different parties of the single East South. Uh, the same goes for Muslim parties or other Tamil parties. They were not involved. It was only the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Elam and the government of Sri Lanka that signed the Memorandum of, of Understanding for a ceasefire agreement, and that were parties uh, to uh, the ceasefire agreement. And despite the fact uh, that the LTT, and that's my third point. The LTT is a very, had a very hierarchical structure. Uh, I think the society in Sri Lanka is up to now a, a fairly feudal society. Despite this fact, the key decision makers were not really involved. Prabhakaran, who had uh, established the LTT in 1972 and was its leader until he was killed in 2009, uh, he never directly participated in the peace talks. And that led to a lot of mistrust. For instance, when the most important agreement was concluded, uh, that was an agreement that the parties agreed to uh, look into federalism as a possible solution to the conflict, it was not very clear whether Prabhakaran really agreed to that agreement or whether it was just his chief negotiator who uh, had agreed to that agreement. And that, uh, again, led to mistrust and eventually to uh, non-implementation of what, what had been agreed. A fourth point, in my view, is that there was no coherent approach of the international community. Uh, Sri Lanka has, has a unique position. It's in South Asia. It has a very dominant neighboring country, India. Uh, China plays a role, and of course the interests of China and India differed widely. Uh, and you could be sure that if India refused to sell arms to the security forces in Sri Lanka, then Pakistan would, of course. And, uh, but this accounts also for the, the European approach. Uh, there were contradictions in terms of dealing with the LTT. The LTT was listed as terrorist organization in many countries. Others uh, tried to deal with the LTT. And that approach, in my view, contradicted to misperceptions among the parties to the conflict. Uh, the LTT, for instance, of course had the perception that they were accepted as sole representatives uh, of the Tamil people, an ambition they always had when uh, Norway just included them as, as a party to the conflict. But also among the government, it was not very clear uh, for them how the international community really felt uh, that a uh, solution to the conflict could look like. Uh, I mentioned a last point, a lack of communication. Uh, it has to do with inclusivity, it has to do with civil society. Uh, Nobody ever tried to explain what was happening, really, in Sri Lanka during the ceasefire negotiations. Uh, the population, especially in the south, there was a lot of mistrust. Uh, there was a lot of mistrust towards Norway, but towards all kinds of compromises. And this uh, eventually led to pressure on the government to resume uh, armed activities. I think that uh, a comp Communication strategy is uh, imperative uh, when you try to uh, solve a conflict. You have to explain to the people why you make certain compromises and why not. And it's kind of strange that even Norway didn't have a communication strategy as such. Uh, certainly they didn't deal with the vernacular media in Sinhalese and Tamil. They when they spoke, they spoke to the English media and were always very reluctant to, to say something. Thank you, Martin. I think it, it echoes a lot of also what we found in other processes. And again, what you mentioned, this, like, how do you create over time support from the public? 
if you don't communicate to them. But I think you, you raised a number of different points also, which I found interesting, that the role of the mediator, in that, in that case, Norway, there's even an, an external evaluation done on that, which is actually available online. Um, I remember every time I was at the Norwegian embassy, you had to cut your way through the demonstrators that were there with, with, with uh, signs against the facilitator, against the mediator. And then you had to, wanted to go out of town and you had to cross your way through all the demonstrations, uh, especially at the time from the Buddhist monks, where you think like the Buddhist monks on the street against the peace process. What is going on? And I think that that was also an expression, how come that, uh, in that they were part of civil society. And I think what I found interesting at the time was also that the international community, as you were saying, was so incoherent in, in, in supporting some civil society groups, but not even the majority of civil society. And the complete ignorance, the peace camp is with us, but the peace camp was maybe below 10%. And so I think, and you mentioned that also in Afghanistan, this internationalization doesn't mean if everybody supports you that it's naturally, naturally good for the process. And I think in what I wanted to ask you, Rafat, in, in Yemen at the moment, uh, I mean, there, there's a situation where the dialogue's results were never implemented, war broke out again. We have seen there's an ongoing process or which goes up and down with the UN to sort of deal another ceasefire deal. So my question is the lessons you're having now from all the factors you listed and we've heard also from the other speakers, what does that mean for the situation today? Is that, can we get a ceasefire arrangement that would be, let's say, an elite deal? And then where, where, were, where are the gains of the dialogue? How can they, in this also devastating economic situation, how can they sort of be safeguarded in, in, in the long perspective? What is your view on that? Yeah, I think on, in the ongoing process right now, it's, it's um, one of the biggest challenges is the ongoing war and the change in reality that has happened since the end of the uh, national dialogue and where we are today. And I think if, if I was to think about how to make the peace process that is ongoing uh, more reflective of the lessons learned uh, from the previous uh, peace process, one thing would be um, the nature of, of a comprehensive peace agreement. So it's still being termed as a comprehensive peace uh, agreement that, that the, is being worked. But I think on one side, inclusivity is still a big issue. Uh, again, not only of um, uh, civil society, youth, women, but also of the key actors uh, in the country. So um, there is no representation of the Southern Movement, for example, there's no representation of the newly emerged militia leaders who are now controlling big uh, parts of the country. Um, and so the representation I is missing. On the other side, we understand how, how kind of tricky it is or how difficult it is to try and get that representation uh, when it's not feasible. Again, you face the same issues. Who do you bring to represent civil society or youth? Um, the local powers that are emerging are still in a state of, of birth, so they're not fully controlling their areas to claim that they would be the ones representing. So it's kind of both sides, uh, if you do it or if you don't, it's still very difficult. So one issue I think is, is the inclusiveness um, and the representation of, uh, of, of the uh, people around the table. Uh, the other issue is again the economy, uh, which right now is not part of the comprehensive peace uh, process or talks. Um, there is no acknowledgement of what everyone around the table has in the back of their minds, which is kind of how do we share revenues and how do we share uh, resources. And there is this tacit assumption that the National Dialogue Conference has already dealt with that. We have the agreement there, so we just build on, on, on what was there already. Uh, but two problems. Number one is if the players truly accepted the outcomes of the National Dialogue, they wouldn't have uh, especially the Houthi and Saleh, the rebel uh, movements, they wouldn't have started this whole new round of conflict if they were in agreement of the way that the national dialogue outcomes uh, came out to be. Um, and so, and, and on the other side, the, the situation on the ground has already changed completely. Um, control over different areas, especially oil producing areas has changed. Um, and so this assumption that it has already happened, uh, we already have agreement, so let's just start from there, uh, let's not talk about that. I think it's, it's, it's not um, making for a very uh, productive uh, peace agreement. Um, and so I think 
that comprehensiveness is still an issue um, in, t in terms of topics. Economy is not there. Sharing of revenue is not there. How do we rebuild and reconstruct? And what are the f the economic incentives for the players to stop the war? Is not clearly there. Uh, and on the other side, the representation around the table still uh, yeah. needs to evolve. Thank you. I think um, this is discussion in the international community at the moment. Should one overload this type of agreements, like ceasefire agreements? Should there be ceasefire agreements, as the name said, ending the violence? Or should there be additional components that makes them almost like complex, comprehensive agreements? And then it takes ages. So I think yeah. there are these two theories, almost like you keep them short and then build on the next steps, or uh, sort of you, you make it complex. And uh, I think it's, it, it's, it's probably very hard to, to answer you. And that's, that's the tension when you mentioned earlier the different hats, for example, yeah. that I'm wearing. Because on one side, kind of as an activist and as a strong believer in inclusiveness, I want everyone to be there. But I know if everyone is there, practically speaking, it's not going to work. And you can't get to an agreement, and you can't make it happen. I want all the topics to be there, but again, practically speaking. So it's always a, a challenge um, between what you would want as a comprehensive peace agreement, what you would want as a researcher looking at how this could easily fail because it does not have all the ingredients, and then as a practical kind of uh, practitioner who knows on, on the ground it doesn't work uh, easily. But I think the challenge is often that then, um, from sort of a decision maker's point of view, they often will say like, "Yeah, don't make it too complicated." So then it's it's again again too easy to say like, "We don't need it," because at the same time we're discussing here that you need it for the sustainability. So I think it's often to do with a sort of sequencing approach. What is also doable in a, in a certain time? Is it? I mean, before you had the same in Yemen where you had an elite deal to end the war, and then you had a, a conference that was discussing it. So I think it's like often the, the sequencing, but what we see often that the international community, like maybe the, the, the youth movement and others, want to put everything there. We have kind of a model that says like, well, in 50 years you should look like Switzerland or something like, or nicer. And, uh, and then we know how Switzerland looks like. So can we have that maybe in the next six weeks already and add every element of Switzerland uh, onto the agenda, which of course is never implementable. And uh, also forgets the situation that Switzerland was a very poor country and uh, didn't have all the rich banks and stuff and chocolate uh, 100 years ago. So I think it's still interesting that the international community overloads everything and doesn't sort of have the sequencing approach and, and thinking about what is doable in a certain time frame and, and, and what not. And in Afghanistan, you mentioned that um, the international community, you, you even said there was a playground and you had certainly a number of very different interests. I was recently in a, in a discussion where we were discussing the failures and of international community and peace and state building and of course Afghanistan came on and on off as an example of not so well in terms of how the international community has. And then somebody said from a government, uh, well, have we ever been in Afghanistan because we wanted to support a peace process or was it not because we wanted to fight terrorism? So let's get our goals right. And I think that also shows that there are conflicting goals and it, it's not only about the peace process. So what does that mean for the future? Um, before I answer that one, I'll go that the people of Afghanistan wish Afghanistan will be a Switzerland <laughs> one day. <laughs> Again, it's uh, just because we also like people to live with a harmony, regardless of which part of the country they are. International community are played, and still they are playing a very significant, important role. When it comes to the peace process, uh, the government of Afghanistan, five years back, even more than five years, they say, Afghan lead peace process. Mm -hmm. This is a message that comes time to time because it's come about the priority. What is the priority for Afghans? And what's the priority of international community? Um, Afghanistan cannot be a good success story for every individual country which is there engaging in Afghanistan. So some countries should accept the reality and of course, those, uh, let's say, uh, uncompleted job. Um, it starts from 2004, when the chapter was just turned, the attention 
returned from Afghanistan. Um, I will not go deep down there. But uh, from my point of view, it's important to have inclusive peace process under United Nations supervision. Um, without it, without international uh, guarantee for peace process, if it's going to just be Afghan approach, I'm afraid again it will be the same scenario as it was happened in Geneva process in um, early 90s and 80s. Because uh, at that time, the people of Afghanistan was not representing. Uh, the government of, of uh, Pakistan was representing on behalf of Afghan Mujahideen. And at that time was uh, Dr. Najib uh, time after Soviet, when uh, Russia left Afghanistan. And then it was a golden opportunity for everyone to come together and go for a free election. It doesn't happen. It's just because of lack of international insurance and guarantee. It's too different when we are talking about terrorism and when we are talking about, uh, let's say, peace process. Um, it, it cannot be carrot and stick in one time, but uh, yes, tackling the terrorism, it means uh, by time, it will increase the crimes to some areas because of civilian casualties and because they have to feed some other, let's say, militant groups. But on long term, it will come with the result that one headache will may gone. Or on the way back, this headache will may be more complicated headache. For instance, in 2004, when just the uh, Taliban group start to, uh, let's say, again, little bit muscles back. Um, it was very difficult for everyone to understand that they are a big uh, threat for Afghanistan. Everybody was, including uh, United Nations, United States and Europe countries think, Taliban is just gone. They will never come back. Mm. But soon they came, they showed that, no, they came more strong, more, let's say, with a um, clear platform, with more resources, and it's get more complication to the peace process. Till that time, there was a no call for peace because we thought it's reconciliation automatically after the Bonn Agreement was happened, and everyone just in the place, and there was an election. If anybody want to run for a political position, they should start and run because it's an election. But it seems to me it doesn't work. Um, I believe for a long, sustainable, peace, a few things are important. First, common view from the international community. If everybody is carrying their own agenda, it wouldn't work. Second, a strong commitment for leaving domestic issue domestically. Third, keeping neighbors to be engaged and also to be responsible. Fourth, um, good economy development plan and program. Of course, more important than this one is justice. We cannot victimize justice for temporary peace. Justice is the key for peace and stability. Rule of law should be implemented without any sorts of discrimination and to consider the rights of minorities and women. These are very important. Um, sometimes I'm afraid as a women rights activist when they're calling, let's say, Afghan lead peace process. If peace is going to be, or political power will be, a, a, let's say, a very delicious cheesecake. Those whom they are sitting around the table, they like to share between them. They don't like even a small portion to be for the vast majority in the country as a women. And therefore, for women, it's very important to do not be only on the menu, but be around the table and to be talked and to do not let their rights to be a piece of negotiation um, of, or other minorities group as well, because democracy is 
a practice and it should be um, with sustainable values, not uh, like uh, those values that today we have and tomorrow it will go on. Thank you very much. I think we use often in when we talk to policymakers about in inclusion and then always the question comes like, yes, more women and then we're going to have more peace and we use often and then there comes this disappointment. So many women were in the national dialogue in Yemen, but what have they achieved? What have they done? It's still the same situation, so we don't need the women. And I think Afghanistan is a good example where you see over time that in the, in the Bonn Agreement, in the consultations, there were a lot of women. But of course, if that was the first time they were involved and allowed to talk, then you can't expect that they're going to change the world in one day. But you see over time that how women activism has grown in Afghanistan and how the women now are pushing for their voice and are listened to. So also here we see that the, the inclusion often takes time. But Afghanistan is also another very debated example in the international mediation community about the issue of how do you deal with these entities that, uh, like the Taliban or ISIS in, in other parts, uh, that don't want actually to mediate and that don't want a deal because actually not achieving the deal is their goal. So I think it's also the, <laughs> the tricky issue, how do you continue it? Martin, you mentioned that before with the LTT as well. You have the international community on the one hand listing these groups and not making a differentiation between a so-called terrorist group that has a political objective, which then you can talk to them, or those who basically uh, uh, live on pursuing terrorist acts. And, but is that now we have in Sri Lanka, a, let's say, a situation where you had a victor's peace, one side won, and now you have a new government, is that now can we sort of, is the victor's peace then, was that the solution to a failed sort of mediation? Uh, is the government now more inclusive? Is it tackling these causes? Are we looking into a brighter future in Sri Lanka? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, uh, let me first say that I think that it's, it's the, in decades now, the best time to have a negotiated political settlement in Sri Lanka. But uh, certain conditions need to be fulfilled, otherwise it won't work. Uh, I think the new government has, has changed a lot uh, with its promise of good governance uh, and then with certain steps towards the Tamils, it has increased certain trust, but uh, trust is still not fully established. And that's, uh, for me, uh, a key reason why uh, a negotiated political settlement is not yet within reach. Uh, the parties still don't trust each other. Uh, the Sinhalese and also the government, I think, still think that when the Tamils want a federal solution, that this is the first step for a separation that they, and that they actually want a separate state. And the Tamils still have this doubt that when the government talks of a unitary state, uh, that it means that the single least dominated government wants to control everything. Uh, a, a second issue for me is that uh, if you really want to uh, come to a solution, it needs a paradigm shift. The paradigm shift within both parties, a paradigm shift that where people try to understand each other and uh, be courageous to, to make bold steps. I don't see that yet in Sri Lanka. The government doesn't make these bold steps, neither do the Tamils. The Tamils have made certain steps. The, the Tamil National Alliance, which, which is the key Tamil party, has, for instance, admitted that the LTT committed uh, war crimes and crimes against humanity. So uh, these are important self-reflections, but uh, they need to go. They need to go further, I think. Uh, but it's also, to a certain extent, it's it's of course uh, there are reasons to be to to not to trust the government. Uh, just recently at the UN General Assembly, for instance, the president uh, has in his speech mentioned that Sri Lanka is a Buddhist country when, uh, of course, 30% of the population is Christian, Muslim or Hindus. And that creates, of course, that these doubts whether the government is sincere in finding a solution. And I want to mention a third 
issue that is dealing with the past. That has not happened in Sri Lanka yet. Sri Lanka has committed itself to, to deal with the past, to address war crimes, uh, the right to truth has been accepted, but the steps have not been bold enough and there's a certain reluctance to really uh, establish uh, a council for transitional justice and look into these war crimes and crimes against humanity that have certainly happened. And that, of course, creates a lot of mistrust uh, within the Tamils, but also among the international community, whether the government is really sincere. Thank you. I would like to open up for questions, comments. Please uh, tell us your affiliation or who you are. Uh, the mic is... Do you need the mic from here? We have a little bit scarcity in this uh, very beautiful building. There's a scarcity usually of microphones, and there's a hard competition, so that's why we have to share it here. So uh, let's start from this end and take it then the other way around. Please, the lady here. Um, hello, my name is uh, Kimana Zulueta Fülscher. I work for International IDEA, an intergovernmental organization uh, based in Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, we support democratic processes and institutions worldwide. Um, thank you very much for the very interesting presentations. I have actually a question for each of you. I have many questions, but I will uh, focus on one only, and I will try to keep it very brief. Um, so for Mr. Alakhali, um, I was wondering why you didn't mention the issue of federalism, because I think it was a very divisive issue throughout the negotiations. The NDC couldn't come up with uh, with a solution to federalism with... with uh, um, yeah, really good recommendations as to how to organize uh, the federal state. Um, and only an appointed body uh, by the president came up with this six region solutions that both the southerners and the Houthis were not uh, really agreeing to. And then uh, the, the war broke, uh, broke out. No? And I just wonder whether you think uh, that this will be an issue that will be resolved uh, throughout uh, this new peace process that is now uh, initiating once again, um, I would say. Um, so I would be interested in, in your thoughts regarding that. Uh, Mr. Stutzinger, uh, very nice to see you again. Um, I, um, I was wondering what, why you think that back then uh, the LTTE uh, decision makers were not really included in the peace process. Um, was it a decision uh, by, uh, by, the, um, by the Sri Lankan government or, or were they themselves not really keen on engaging directly in the talks? Uh, what was the logic behind that? Um, and Ambassador Baraksai, if I pronounce it correctly, <laughs> sorry. Um, I was wondering, uh, because of course the Taliban were not included in the constitution building process, there was no ceasefire agreement with them or peace agreement with them uh, to start with. I was wondering whether you think that that would have been possible back then, uh, or whether the circumstances have changed enough uh, to make it possible now to open up another peace process. Uh, and my second question, um, do you think that the constitution building process was, uh, was too soon? Uh, do you think that perhaps the interim process should have been longer uh, to, to try for Afghan civil society and uh, the society uh, in, in its broadest sense to come to terms again after so many years of war? Thank you. Yeah, who was it? Please, here. Thank you very much. My name is Lefna Gönac. I'm a PhD student in political science here based at the Institute. I have a question for Yemen. Can you elaborate uh, a little bit on the outside influence and interest in the continuation of conflict in Yemen? And I have one uh, short comment, if you let me. I think we have too much uh, confidence and belief uh, in representation actually in this room, because apparently representation election is not no longer working as we want. Uh, there is apparent distrust uh, and uh, insincerity between those who are elected and uh, those who are represented. Uh, people are no longer having trust and belief uh, to, to those who, uh, who are supposed to represent them. What we need instead is a system which allows for continuous and everyday practice of elaboration, uh, um, persuasion, and actual discussion. Unless we have such a system, representation and election uh, will not actually work as we want them to. Thank you. Your neighbor over there. 
Hello, it was a really great discussion. Thank you for that. Um, I'm Nikita and I'm studying here at the Institute and um, I have uh, one, one major question which can be addressed to all of you. It's basically that uh, when we talk about these negotiations, we many times see that these negotiations are just put forward uh, to actually expand the idea that, well, yes, we can have a negotiation possible. So do you think that uh, many of these negotiations failed because we did not reach the point of negotiability? when there's a critical mass within each of the groups, within in-group and out-group, wanting to actually have a negotiation as a legitimate and achievable pathway towards a peaceful solution? Or is it that should we move forward for a negotiation and try to explain and hope for um, that the idea of negotiability can be attained during the process, and then it can move forward? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, move up. Yes, lady there, and then we come to the other side. Thank you. My name is Vera Lalchevska, and I am a PhD, former PhD student here. I just graduated. Um, I would like to draw a parallel, and I think my, my question also um, kind of draws on the other previous questions. Uh, I would like to draw a parallel to um, the paradox of humanitarian action and uh, whether humanitarian action is actually doing more harm than good. And the same goes for uh, mediation and, and peace negotiations, et cetera. And this kind of um, draws on the comment that uh, the ambassador said earlier what, on um, sources of war and whether one of them would be, could be international interests. And, um, and the, the point that Martin made about, sorry, I'm using your first name, <laughs> can't pronounce it, um, on the um, mistrust. And um, coming from the Balkans, I've, uh, there's a lot of mistrust by the population on international interests and involvement in conflict and peace and conflict resolution and so on and so forth. So could you please, maybe in short words, all of you, um, tell us if it's, um, is, it, is the question really to negotiate and not, or not to, to intervene or not to, to mediate or not to mediate, uh, full stop, and not even go into the details that um, Tanya had mentioned um, on whether a long-term, a complex, or short-term. Thanks. Let's go to the other side. The gentleman in the back first. Thank you. It was a rather enlightening talk. My my question is is and directed. And who are you? Who are you? Pardon me, sorry. My name is Abdul Manan, and I am a student of international politics and religious studies. I study in the United States. I'm originally from Kashmir, so I know a thing or two about conf living in conflict anyways. Uh, my question is, is for Ambassador Barakzai. Uh, six months ago, I was at a reception with uh, um, Ambassador Brahimi, and an Afghan friend of mine asked him about what he thought of the future of, uh, of Afghanistan, to which he replied without any hesitancy that uh, Ashraf Ghani is one of the smartest statesmen he has known. Having said that, and I believe him, I've been following his work for a long time, ever since he was a um, professor, uh, right till he has become president. My question to you, uh, Madam Ambassador, is that when we look at Afghanistan today, and we, when we talk about peace process and a sustainable peace process, an important aspect of that peace, sustainability of peace, is institution building. And I don't want to pass off as, as an expert in Afghanistan, so I will borrow something from an expert in Afghanistan, who's Ahmed Rashid, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're aware of him, uh, who argues that when it comes to military, economic, and political transitions in Af uh, institutions in Afghanistan, especially the economic and, and, and political institution building, that we've almost lost the battle. So how, and, and we are doing very poorly in Afghanistan, so how would you, as, as a representative of the administration, uh, one, cite the challenges that there are, and B, made the progresses that you've made in, in Afghanistan when it comes to institution building that inevitably will sustain peace, nothing else will? Thank you. Thank you. Oh, we have one more, and that's the gentleman in the middle here. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Chatanya. I'm a student here in Masters in International Affairs in the Institute. 
Uh, my question is basically regarding the relationship between uh, justice and trust in, in many ways, uh, something that came out in the conversation. Uh, and uh, my question is regarding how, like, in a post-conflict situation, we see that the rule of law is so weak that uh, giving out that form of justice to build up that trust is something that's deemed very difficult in the first place. Uh, so in, in the Sri Lankan context, when we look at the uh, solution of, or rather an uh, advice of a truth and reconciliation uh, commission which is being set up, do you think that is a good way to go forward or are there any alternative mechanisms that we can look at for uh, justice to be given in a post-conflict situation for sustainable peace? Thank you. Any last super urgent question? Okay. Because we would like here, the lady here, because other, after that I would like to give the panelists the time to answer the six PhD questions they got uh, in terms of writing their PhD for the next five years. Thank you. At least the microphone's getting closer to the front, right? Um, Fairly Shapui, DCAF, Geneva. Uh, my question is about inclusion in peace processes. Inclusive processes is not the same as inclusive decision making. Uh, what do you think the repercussions of one versus the other are in terms of implementation? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, let's get the mic back to the panel and you are free to answer whatever you want <laughs> and uh, you have each a few minutes because uh, the challenge is that we end up in time because there's a nice uh, small buffet waiting for us actually and uh, so your answer stand between us and lunch so <laughs> be to the point I give you the floor first thank you um, yeah maybe I'll start with the federalism uh, question which was as you said one of the most contentious um, issues there and I think again that was a case where uh, reality had to match with expectations mm -hmm. Um, and, and although for a lot of people that were inside the national dialogue, nobody was convinced fully, um, especially the politicians, that this was a workable uh, solution, that they were going to be able to implement a federal system. But the masses would not accept anything but a new idea to come out. It was not acceptable anymore to tell <coughs> the people that went out, especially in the south, in the north, in Saada, uh, all across Yemen that um, you know, we, we'll just go back to our local administration where it was just not working well, but we'll tweak it, we'll fix it, and it'll get better. That was not accepted anymore. The, the ceiling was already very high, independence, secession. Um, and so something new had to come out that would convince people that there's a new thing now, things will get better. And that was where federalism uh, came into play. But as you mentioned, nobody was able to square it with how it would work on the ground. Um, nobody was able to figure out how to come up with an inclusive process um, to divide uh, the regions uh, in the country. And, and, and nobody was able to find a clear formula for revenue sharing as well. Uh, so it was only very big headlines uh, that was agreed in the national dialogue um, to try and kick the can forward, as, as, as we say, and, and just leave, you know, buy some time. Uh, and that's what, what got us um, later into, into more problems. Now, as I mentioned, in the current process, there, that is still one of the big issues is that the assumption is still there that this was already agreed upon in the national dialogue. So let's not talk about uh, the um, structure of, of governance uh, in the country. Everyone already agreed on federalism. Uh, that's already in the draft constitution. Let's not talk about it. So that's, I think, one of the major issues that are still um, uh, not resolved. Um, Maybe I'll just take one more question and then I'll leave the colleagues uh, to answer the rest. Outside interference and interest, I think that's something that Yemen very much uh, suffers from, um, is, is a big part of this conflict, big part of what happened before. And maybe it ties um, to what Martin was mentioning uh, earlier about the necessity of having a, um, a facilitator or a moderator that is seen as, uh, as neutral. Uh, because right now, even if we look at the um, current UN-led process and previous UN, it is still very much dominated by key international and regional players that are not necessarily seen as neutral by, by the sides of the uh, conflict. So we're still missing that piece, um, and, and it's, I think, contributing a lot to the uh, difficulty of the process. Mm -hmm. 
Next. Yeah, go ahead. Thanks. Uh, I'll start with the question whether uh, uh, the, the level of, of uh, the negotiators. Uh, no, the LTT uh, took the decision that uh, Prabhakan would not be involved. And that was, of course, because the government also didn't send the Prime Minister for this uh, negotiation. So the, the LTT was very much aware of, of the level and it was very important to them. For instance, uh, when there was a pre-donor conference to an important conference uh, in, in uh, Tokyo, and that took place in Washington. The LTT was banned in the US, so they could not participate in that. Uh, just it was a preparatory meeting, basically. And that was the reason for them to suspend their participation in the peace talks. So they were very much aware of, of, of the, all these intricacies. And, and if Ranil Wickremesinghe, the Prime Minister, would have participated himself. Maybe Pravakan would have, but uh, not just with an ordinary minister. Then he sends his other people. Uh, on the fact whether negotiations can come too early. Uh, in Sri Lanka, certainly, they didn't come too early. It was There was a, a high level of suffering, and I think both parties were actually urged by the uh, by their people to to go for negotiations in in Sri Lanka certainly uh, the Tamils urged uh, the the LTT to go into some kind of compromise it was difficult for the LTT to maintain their structure and their pressure and uh, I think that led e eventually to to these negotiations but they came too early in the sense that they were not really well structured and and well designed and and i think that despite the urgency of having a negotiation you have to be aware that uh, process design is is crucial in order to make it a success uh, the last question may be on on the uh, structures now for for uh, Re-establishing justice in Sri Lanka, the judiciary uh, is, a, is a tremendous problem. It has been politicized and it will remain politicized for years to come uh, because of the decisions that were taken earlier. But I think the government is on many ways uh, on the right track. It has established an office for missing persons. It has established a secretariat for reconciliation. More needs to be done. Uh, the, the key question for me is whether the government is really uh, trying to change or just ticking the box, because they made certain promises uh, to the Human Rights Council in, in a resolution. And sometimes I have the impression that it's not really uh, keen on addressing the issues, but rather fulfilling uh, promises that they made to the international community. It's, it's many times it's mentioned uh, by the government or by ministers that they have to do this because uh, they promised that in Geneva. But that's not the reason to do it. The reason is that you should go for a reconciliation process. And I think that mindset is still not there. I'll promise I'll not keep you for long. Um, about the strong, sustainable institution for the government, of course, it's necessarily. But uh, I will give you a few examples, then I will leave the, all of you to just think and judge yourself. 2014, more than 135,000 troops was been withdrawn from Afghanistan. More than 3,054. 56 project was been stopped and the development aid budget was some kind of was get freeze because of the crisis of Kabul Bank. The government was changed and shift in 2014 uh, by election, of course, with some political crisis, but still the government of Afghanistan is functioning. Everybody would think that, okay, 2014 will maybe the end, but it wasn't the end. I believe our institution are more strong 
than what Afghan experts are thinking about. When it comes for the early constitution, without, uh, let's say, negotiating properly or not, it was a part of timetable on Bonn Agreement. And thanks God that it was done soon. Because the constitution made by what exactly the people of Afghanistan want. Every single article is relying and saving the public rights. If we ask and call for constitution to make it today, under today's circumstances, of course we will may not have a very democratic, open, reformist constitution. It will may be a different constitution, similar like our neighbor country, uh, Islamic Republic of Iran. When it comes for the, let's say, opportunity for the Taliban, or can we go uh, for peace with them? I believe that if Taliban are clever, uh, they will accept the request of ceasefire first. Because after the death of Mullah Omar and Mullah Mansur, they've been like um, not anymore under one umbrella. They are in Kuwait uh, Shura, Peshawar Shura, and Qatar office, and some of them are really supporting peace process within Afghanistan. So therefore, if they like to, let's say, reconcile them, and thinking about long-term political participation in Afghanistan, um, it's better for them as soon as they can, they should take uh, the decision. Otherwise, the message from the government and from the people of Afghanistan will be the same. The message will may not be changed. Uh, it's difficult, and I think it might be on dream again to have the Taliban regime back to rule the country. It's impossible. It is totally impossible. It is uh, 21st century, and it's a different Afghanistan from what was even 16 years back from today. Um, I believe engaging international players on your domestic issue uh, if they are really constructive and they are thinking that there's a shared view about national interest of success will be on their benefit, it's really good. Otherwise, doing our homework is the best. Thank you very much. I would like to just a few, a few points in terms of uh, summing up. I think the issue of... Um, the, the, the timing and the sequencing, I think, is very important when we talk about what, what we have heard from you. Is it a ceasefire agreement? Is it a comprehensive agreement? In what context it fits? But whatever it is, I think what we have heard from you, the issue of inclusiveness and representativeness is key. But you have also mentioned, like, we have to look deeper into how the representative is really representative. Why? Because we see, and I think uh, not the last have we seen this on Monday morning, looking to the US, the disconnect between people and the political elite. And uh, that needs what all of you also mentioned, the public support for the processes through a lot of communication that apparently is needed in these processes to make really clear to people what is going on and what are also the benefits. But I think you made this point very strong also on the economic factors that you cannot have a peace deal that is only dealing with the political issues. And you also pointed about uh, the justice issues that need to come. So again, we have the complexity of getting everything together, but how do we, in what kind of steps do we address this? In an, in, in the, of course, inclusion comes up and now, and also the women need to be included, everybody, but when and how, I think, is, is, is the crucial uh, question. And the last point for me is really the international community, as we have uh, mentioned. There's all these new attempts. Uh, we're talking about 20 years about coordinated, coherent approaches. I mean, everybody who's been in this business can't hear it any longer. Um, but it's still not there because there are so many different and conflicting goals of different countries. And it's not only, let's say, uh, the West against the rest, and as you said, the Asian powers against these ones, but it's also within different actors. And that is the hard thing to sort of um, bring the political elites of the country on track, support the process, and at the same time also having uh, the international community speaking with one voice, which probably will never happen. 
but how do you deal then with this and uh, come through the processes? And I think um, a lot is what you mentioned, a combination of good process design, but being very aware of the reality of the power dimensions of, of, of countries and not sort of um, fooling ourselves that this is just a nice process design needed, but it's a lot of long-term sort of thinking. And you said Afghan only led is also not the job, but of course without sort of the leadership of, and the engagement of people like you here to say like, this is what we, we are here and to not lose the hope also that things will be better as a driving factor, I think is very important. Before I invite you all for, um, for a buffet lunch, which will be in petal one, actually, that means you have to go up the stairs and then go into the other petal opposite of the, of the entrance. I would like to um, also invite you to visit our webpage, inclusivepeace.org, where you can also sign up to our newsletter, upcoming soon. And um, you can also follow us on Twitter to get new uh, things we, we are doing and publishing. And I would like to really thank our partners here, the Interparliamentary Union, for bringing the ambassador here and for the really good cooperation we had and um, also for sponsoring the lunch. So be wary. And, uh, and also for, for, for the German mission to bring you here, but also for this, for this cooperation and the introductory words of the ambassador and for the cooperation we're having and for the Swiss government to let Martin go <laughs> and uh, <laughs> talk and say what he had to say. And thank you for really very interesting inputs and thank you for interesting questions. And thank you to our team at IPTI who has organized this event, especially to Pauline, who has um, not only communicated well, but also done a lot of organization for this event. Thank you very much. And thank you all for being here.